So welcome everybody to our very first live event. Wonderful to see you all so far. Your co-hosts, I really should say, are spotlit for you all, or spotlighted. I'm never sure what is the right way to conjugate that. Um, and so I'm going to welcome Claire Marshall, Claire O'Rourke and Ronan McDomhale. Uh, tragically, because of flight arrangements, Grr. Uh, ben Bowen is unable to join us today. He is right now in the air on his way up to Darwin, heading to Gama, uh, which for any of you that aren't aware is the largest gathering of um, Aboriginal First Nations and First Nations advocacy groups in Australia. Ben was supposed to be flying out this afternoon. He's in the air right now. So unfortunately, we um, acknowledge him in his absence uh, and we will not have a representative to speak to the opportunity right now for Aboriginal people. So the intention for today is I'm going to introduce you to our guests. We're then going to have a co-hosted conversation for 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to explore the conversations that we most want to host right now. And then you are going to go into those hosted conversations. You folk, the non-spotlighted folk. Um, and then we're going to have a collecting, collective sharing back. So I'm just going to introduce everybody um, in the order that I see them. So Claire O, as she will be known in this moment from here forth, uh, is someone that I've only been knowing for a very short period of time. Uh, Rebecca Huntley uh, is unable to attend but today. She just started a wonderful new job. Uh, and Rebecca very, very kindly uh, recommended and introduced uh, Claire and I uh, so that she can come and speak to her lengthy experience and work in climate stuff, I'll just say for the time being. Uh, Claire has a book that's coming out kind of like literally out of the gate right now. Um, so all very exciting, very timely and wonderful to, to, to welcome her here. Claire Marshall, Claire M. Uh, is someone I've been knowing a little bit longer, very honoured and uh, deeply privileged to, to be knowing each other. Uh, Claire's work most recently is in regenerative futures, uh, designing <coughs> and inviting uh, experiential futures. If you could mute yourselves, please, I would be appreciative of that. Um, and yeah, what are futures? Our, you know, our futures, things that, you know, we create, we co-create, you know, we live and uh, and certainly influence the present. That's kind of the, the crux of Claire's work. And then Ronan, Ronan McDomhow uh, is the person I've been knowing the most in uh, the guest panel today. Uh, Ronan's work, really interesting confluence of software development, um, neuroscience and uh, mental health. Uh, right now specifically deployed through uh, a business and uh, a software platform called CRED, which looks to bring people together, more deeply connect them and bring them into action and activity to foster deeper connection, more meaning in each person, group and the greater world. So if anybody wants to quickly course correct anything, I've just fumbled my way through an introduction, please do. <laughs> Otherwise, We'll jump straight in with an invitation to our panel to respond to this question. Through your own lens, how do you see the window of opportunity right now? Whoever wants to jump in first. So you can all unmute yourselves now on the panel and let's get into it. I can jump in. It's great to be here. My name's Claire. I'm one of two Claire's on the panel today. Um, I'm dialing in from Darawal country, which is just um, north of Wollongong. I wanted to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. And the Darawal is actually the cabbage palm, which grows in the subtropical rainforest in the escarpment near me. Um, I have, I've worked in um, social justice and climate advocacy for about um, 15, 20 years. And, um, you know, I've just done an exploration of what's going on in Australia on climate because that's the issue I'll work on for the rest of my working life and spend most of my waking and sleeping hours on it. Um, but what I discovered through this process of looking a little bit beyond the kind of politics and policy world that I'm usually ensconced in is this kind of incredible alignment that we have now between, you know, economics, technology, politics and policy, and also community attitudes, which is just like 
this convergence that's happening now in this moment is just extremely exciting. Um, you know, in terms of technology and economics, you know, we've we've got a lot going for us, but I think we kind of forget how how much, how far we've come. Like we underestimate what we can achieve. So, you know, looking at the International Energy Agency, they predicted that solar average solar prices would be five cents a kilowatt hour by 2050, but it happened in six years, and it's now cheaper for countries to switch from coal fired. Um, generation to renewables than it is to swap from coal to gas as a bridge to renewables. So that's several studies are, are bringing those that knowledge to light. So we've got this kind of beautiful kind of coalescence of technology and economics. In terms of politics in this country, we've had an you know, incredible reset moment and you know the 43% target is now you know, set with the UN and we've got legislation before the parliament. But the really interesting alignments around community because I did a study back in 2020, a market research study that showed that about one quarter of Australians aged between um, 16 and 75 are really worried about climate change. We So much so that that segment, we called them the alarmed. And that's about, that's 5 million Australians are, are really concerned. And so we've seen that reflected obviously in the recent um, federal election, but it's also we a bunch of work that we did through that study showed some really interesting insights about the behaviour that people are engaged in that we could talk about perhaps later in this conversation. I think people are waiting for invitations and also need some confidence to be able to step into to climate action. So it's just a beautiful convergence at this moment in time, which is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we can dig into a little bit more today. Yeah, thanks, Claire. I love that. I'd actually really love to hear Ronan's thoughts on accepting invitations, because I know that this has been so important in, in your work. Thanks, um, Tim, and thanks for sharing, Claire. And I've had a, a quick look at your book, and I think it's perfect timing. And congratulations on on writing a book and, and putting it out there. Uh, so I'm looking at this through the lens of, as, as Tim said, um, mental health. So helping people look after themselves and helping people look after others and the planet. So through the lens of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And to Claire's point there, uh, I think there's it's an exciting time. Um, I think people are seeking and needing a new way of being. And I, I strongly believe that the systems and, and the processes that work for us in the past, they serve us to a point, but we need something different now. I think there's a need and a gap for courageous leadership for in terms of organizations, leaders and organizations and, and self-leadership as well. And I think we need to make it as easy as possible for people to access these things. Like, what can I do to impact climate action? Not leaving it to someone else, because we're all pointing fingers and waiting for someone else to do things. Nothing's going to happen or change. So I think to summarize, um, it's it's an exciting time. It's, there's a need um, and we just need courage to take next steps. Beautiful, thank you, Ronan. Um, Claire M, you've been pensively poised, waiting. I have, and I think I, I love the positivity and everything. And I want to take slightly a different tack, but I'll get to the positive side as well, which is that, so I've been living up in the Northern Rivers and I think what we've seen, so from, from my work, I specialize in experiential futures. So the, the future is so difficult and uncertain that um, it can be hard for us to really contemplate seriously. So sometimes when you can create real experiences of what a future might be like, it allows us to make kind of better decisions. And we've had these experiences of what the future and the climate change is like. We've had these devastating bushfires and then the floods. Um, you know, poor Lismore was flooded twice epically. And the community that, that, um, that I was living in, you know, really came together. We saw a lot of courageous leadership, not necessarily from the usual sources, but from people just going, I'm going to step up and I'm going to go and help people in my community. But I think that this, even though this has been a really difficult time and there's a lot of people still in trauma and still hurting and a lot of community building that's happened, there has also been a lot of thought of, especially with, I think, the twin floods that we need to seriously consider 
structures for the future if we know that these extreme weather events are going to keep happening. And I've heard really deep conversations happening uh, around what we need to do to change and what kind of leadership we need to help change that. So I think there's an, I don't know, I feel like a bit of a negative, but there's also these things bubbling up as people start to really go, okay, like it's here, it's serious. And like, we're starting to move in a different direction. Thank you. Um, I might just build on, on all of that and say that the big shift that I'm sort of sensing a rising awareness of is a need to address our culture and at the level of like, what is our purpose as a nation? Um, arguably what is our purpose as a species? But I think certainly I would really love to see an open dialogue about what is Australia's purpose and what are Australian values right now and, and how do they connect to, yeah, what's needed at the local level. Uh, you know, how do, how does that bring community, um, you know, to life, and and how does that drive institutions, systems, structures, and enterprises all in a convergent direction? Um, and you know, I was in conversation with a group in Melbourne yesterday, and kind of like planted something with someone who was speaking very passionately about the need to reduce emissions and the need to deal with all this stuff, and. I kind of just kind of sat there with them for a little bit and, and then said, well, okay, um, yes, yes, yes. And climate change is a symptom, right? It's not the disease. <laughs> so there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of causation that, that we need to sort of address and speak to as well here. And I think that really plays into what everyone has said so far, but to me most significantly, Ronan, you know, this, this sort of realisation that, you know, there's a, there's a need um, in each of us that that we need to address more fully um, as we as we go in with this work. Um, so we're about the halfway point in this conversation right now. Um, I can sense some emergent themes already, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold them nested just in myself for the moment. Um, who'd like to pick up the thread next? Sensing a lot of energy in you, Claro. Yeah. I'm just. Um... It's just everything that we've been talking about is just really coming together for me in one of the stories um, that I managed to capture in the book. And it's the community of Cobargo, which is, you know, down the south coast of New South Wales. Um, you might remember that community for folks who aren't from Australia. Cobargo hit the national headlines um, during the Black Summer fires because our Prime Minister went down there and was not well received by the community. Um, but what was more interesting, this community of about, you know, 800 people, the town centre was decimated by the fires. Um, the community was really in crisis. Um, and there was a wonderful person called Deborah Summer who is schooled in something called the art of hosting, which is essentially kind of well-facilitated group conversations. It's, um, you know, a global network of practice, community of practice. And she pulled together what they called the Cobago community catch-ups. And they started hosting in-person catch-ups when anyone would come. The first one had 100 people turn up and it was just around creating well-facilitated time and space for people to reconnect, heal, and then mm. quite quickly started creating new possibilities. It unleashed a plethora of kind of this kind of organic growth of projects and helped leverage, you know, community fundraising efforts that brought in millions of dollars to help rebuild the town centre, many with cooperative owned ventures, like most of the rebuild is going to be cooperative run. Um, they've got a tool library now, they've created art and creative projects. Um, it's just really interesting that kind of small interventions of creating time, like well facilitated and well held time and space has just helped that community heal. There's still loads of challenges in that community, there's still people trying to find housing, there's still there's been a lot of um, enormous mental health impacts, as you can imagine. But it's just this kind of beautiful planting seeds and allowing for reconnection and healing is like a, a form of leadership I think we can um, really reflect on and capture and look at how you can grow that. It's just, it's just a beautiful story of how small interventions can create really outsized impacts when you kind of don't know where those pathways will lead. I think picking up on that, I think there's something um, really interesting, like um, after the floods in the Northern Rivers, I I've almost, I think everyone that I knew ended up taking a couple of weeks off work and volunteering. And 
after a community that was quite split due to the pandemic and different beliefs and everything, it was like this moment where everyone kind of came together and, and you know, and I think that um, something that, that, like the art of hosting like these, these Cobago community catch-ups, we don't have a lot of opportunities to just connect with our community in day-to-day -day life. And I think a lot of people that I knew had absolutely, including myself, had a wonderful time volunteering. I didn't want to go back to work because I, you know, I was having a lot of fun. I was making all these new friends, having these different and new conversations. And maybe that's something that really is kind of missing, I think, in, in society when we don't have natural disasters. Yeah, thank you, Claire. I I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. But I have, a, I have a question that we might speak in about, about spaces. Um, but um, yeah, it's really interesting that you, you bring up um, that story and, and that township in particular. Um, and I'm really honoured to know some Kabargans and have gotten to know them through training people in Art of Hosting um and which is a is a program underway uh up and down the 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 south coast now um that i've been invited to to sort of become um part of that team and just to link this into ronan's work specifically like what's emerged through that work is that if we just look at housing as an example so of i forget the specific number but i know the percentage of homes that's been rebuilt is a 7% of homes that were destroyed in the black summers have been rebuilt in that region, right? In the lower part of the South Coast. And there's been lots of speculation about what that is. Yes, there was issues with funding. Yes, there were issues with um, council bureaucracy. All of those barriers have been removed and yet the rebuilding process has not happened. And what the um, indicators are pointing to at the moment is the number one reason for that is unresolved trauma and mental health issues. And that simply sitting down, looking at floor plans, looking at you know, paint brochures is so triggering to people. And some people have now very much adopted a, an identity of a bushfire survivor who lives in a caravan and that's basically become their story. Um, other people, you know, it, it, it's the trauma of what they've lost and that they're still working their way through a grief cycle. Um, and a lot of those people are really finding that the best space for them to be is not one-on-one -on -one in a therapy room with a person that they don't really know terribly well. It's in circle, in community with others who are on the same journey. Um, so Ronan, would you like to comment on anything about your work in, in regards to working together through this kind of process? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I just want to add to what both Claire's talked about in terms of those experiences and the you know, care and experiential learning like i know those situations happen with the disasters on both fronts and um, but how do we help people create those experiences and and make them as, as i said earlier on simple and accessible so you, you talked about our, our work you know so we are a technology and education company the purpose of our company is to simply help people live learn and give every day and we want to inspire people to do three actions every day one action every day to look after yourself so put your own oxygen mask on first and support your own mental health. One action every day to learn and to grow as a person and one action every day to help others and a planet. And you know, what we found is by creating those experiences for people and making them a simple to experience that feeling of helping others. You know, we know from a neuroscience perspective that feeling of what I help others lasts twice as long as when I guess I never see myself. So how do we, through communities, through organizations help people help others because you know cred comes from the Irish word for, for believe we're a belief driven organization and, and we firmly believe that the more we help each other the more we help ourselves and we, we talked about at the start around the traditional models of of success and i think this time in the last couple of years has got us really good at questioning and resetting and, and people are evaluate, evaluating their lives and going I trust in this process and I thought it was going to bring me happiness, but has it really like, is it all about like <laughs> wealth accumulation <laughs> or like being on this preordained escalator of life? And I think people are, so go back to people are seeking and needing something different. So how do we, in our roles as community leaders or leaders of organizations, I'll go back to this 
courageous leadership. How do we inspire and help others to help others? So we're very fortunate to have worked with universities and organizations around the world. And when we see the impact that people have of helping themselves, but also helping others, you know, it's, 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 um, it fuels us to keep going. And uh, kudos to you, Tim, for, I, I like the way someone said in the comment, thanks for convening this conversation, because these are the conversations that fuel us to keep going. And so thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Right. You know, this is a collective endeavor. You know, there's 17 beings energy in this field right now. And yeah, we're expecting some more and whoever shows up are the right people. So here you are. Thank you. Uh, OK, so I think it's I feel I sense it's time for our second prompt to our panel, um, which is. What are the conversations or what is the conversation that you want, you most want to host right now, right now being the next kind of, well, I'm going to say 20 minutes, right? So is there a specific theme? Is there a prompt? Is there a calling question that you would love to invite the people, the beings that are here with us to explore with you for the next 20 minutes? I'm happy to go again. How can we live and lead more consciously? I would like to be provocative and say, how can we disentangle ourselves from the capitalist mindset? I think it's changed how we think about a lot of things, the principles of capitalism. And I think that, you know, a lot about how we see each other and how we see our roles and how we see time and how we see ourselves. So I think that there's a bit of, disentangling to do before we can choose a new path? Mine's probably a bit of a leadership question around how do we kind of claim our agency in um, working on climate change and how do we um, do that through our networks? Because when you're thinking in systems, you're thinking about how you can create leverage within systems. So, and, you know, given the way our society is structured, there will be folks who have more influence in that system and there'll be others who have less but I'm kind of interested in how we create outsized impact through kind of leveraging our networks but key to that is claiming our agency and you know stepping into the space with confidence. Welcome 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 back. I'm actually singing on recording there you go welcome back. Maybe we need to have a collective <clears throat> vocal expression. Um, okay so we'll just wait for everybody to, to jump back in. Hopefully there'll be a couple of moments. Well, they've actually only got 16 seconds before they're forcibly evicted. <laughs> we were good. We, we did what we were. You did. You did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was not long enough. They never are. They never are. They never are. I hope that was sufficient. I hope some of you had uh, have, a, have a sense of completeness um, in, in the time that we have given ourselves permission to be together. Um, so let me just re-spotlight just in the, actually, no, maybe, maybe spotlighting is not required. I think we, all, we have enough of a sense of who's here. Okay. So whoever wants to jump in first, our three room conveners, what's the, what was the, the vital essence of the dialogue that emerged in your room? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So first of all, I'm very grateful to been part of a wonderful conversation that people shared so beautifully and, uh, so energetically. So the first thing I would say is there is a energy um, in these communities of an energy in our conversation. There's a curiosity. Like people are coming, not having all the answers, but a genuine curiosity to learn more. Um, we won't name names, but someone talked about, you know, people coming together from the heart as well, which I thought was beautiful. We asked, you know, what does a, what does a life and leader, what does a life uh, led consciously look like and one response was does your life reflect your authentic self and that, that really resonated with a lot of people so i just yeah I, I think there's a huge opportunity we talked about what's the wind of opportunity so i think just to reflect back to the first question you asked tim there is an opportunity and people are seeking and needing 
and people who want to be part of something bigger themselves to make real impact in the world. So thank you again for the opportunity to have this conversation and thank you to the people who are part of our conversation. Well, I can I can go next if you like. Um, so we sort of we sort of started talking and we started kind of breaking capitalism down a little bit and kind of thinking about, you know, uh, is it capitalism or is it neoliberalism? And and Guido shared some examples in Germany where companies need to have stakeholders rather than shareholders. But then that kind of led us onto a discussion of, well, even that is quite human centric. And do we need an even uh, an approach where state nature and the environment is a stakeholder and that maybe going from human centric to like living systems or, or planet centric uh, thinking, which led us to from sustainability to regeneration and ideas of, of you know, place and people thriving together. And then um, Karina kind of had a really great uh, point on how difficult it is to change our mindset before we actually kind of question our mindset and and dig into that. So I thought that was quite interesting. So we got quite practical actually in our conversation around claiming agency with Timothy and Darren. So I think what we exposed, um, and certainly the research reflects this, that you know you need to adopt if we're going to allow people to step into their agency, we need to create kind of adaptive strategies that are quite specific to different groups and different individuals. So, you know, there's particular challenges that folks in our conversation had or particular opportunities around engaging different groups of people or individuals in accelerated um, climate action. And, um, you know, we know that we need to create quite specific strategies to allow people to step into their leadership, whether that's through a coaching approach or whether that's through um, letting behaviour change lead. You know, sometimes we might have, you know, quite sceptical folks that want to go and um, that are sceptical about climate change or its causes or solutions. But once they step into some of the practices, some of the money saving or, you know, health benefits, you know, that can actually drive attitude change um, after the experience. So um, I think the question of how we're creating um, experiences for people that allow them to step in to claim their agency is, is interesting for us to consider. And thanks, it was a really interesting conversation. Thank you all, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, it, so for my, me, um, my observations, you know, just to, yes, being part of and, and witnessing, um, you know, the first conversation and then watching the flow as you all decided where to go. You know, like here we have three fascinating questions and another one. Um, and the one which, you know, was sort of aired as, you know, kind of a bit edgy and, you know, maybe a bit controversial, like that was actually where the majority of people wanted to go. Um, and I think there's another whole thing here in like giving ourselves permission to explore the taboo, right? Um, and I mean, it was a shock to me uh, how many of you would be aware of this already, but it, it didn't kind of get as much news as, as, as some of us felt that it could have. But there was a <clears throat> there was an action taken by the British government in 2020 to prevent schools teaching material that was deemed as anti-capitalist. Yep. Claire, she, Claire's, Claire and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Right, so. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, in fact, I I did a big lecture a few weeks ago and made the point in front of my students that I couldn't I couldn't give a lecture on capitalism uh, and anti capitalism in England. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it, it, I've recently completed a a, a short course uh, that's run by Griffith Uni. Um, in conjunction um, with um, Nina, the New Economies Network Australia, and like it's just such a fascinating space to step into and look at how many other ways of organising economically there are. Right, you know, I'm pretty sure it was um, a line that's now been attributed to, but was not actually from Winston Churchill, who said that capitalism is just you know, the least worst system that, that, you know, that we have. Um, well, there's many other <laughs> things that we could think about. Um, 
so yeah just really interesting that that's where the conversation's gone and obviously a really rich and fertile you know sort of landscape for you to explore together so i'm going to open this up now open season uh, no need to name yourselves or identify uh, directly if you don't wish to do so um but with the time that remains and we've got kind of six minutes left on the clock and i'm going to hold the space open for for a little while maybe sort of 15 minutes or so if anyone just wants to hang out i'll stop the recording on time so if there's anything really dangerous that you want to say you can hold it for you know after that um but yeah does anybody have a question or anything that they'd like to express and just sort of freely speak in that will be on the record um in these next few minutes um kind of the bottom frog principle or or kind of this short-term thinking versus longer-term thinking coupled with kind of delayed gratification because i've been observing this for a while and, and maybe i'm convincing myself of the evidence that i keep seeing but it's like you know there's so many people can handle delayed gratification and they're the ones that kind of theory shows that they're kind of ones that succeed but there's a lot of people who don't so when we make choices between present uh current kind of gain versus future gain most people a lot of people choose the, the current so how much of this issue that we're facing today is to do with convincing the larger part of the of society i guess that we need to make those sacrifices for the benefit of the future which ultimately is good for everyone well can i jump in i don't know what yeah sure <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, I think this is really interesting. I think that um, we've also, you know, as modern society has has progressed, our our ability to think on longer time scales has decreased, and we I, we can see a lot of evidence on this, even from like the new cycle, which has become really condensed. But the other thing that I wanted to add that I think is super interesting, which is that um, this process of prioritizing the present over over the future, you know, this process of temporal discounting increases dramatically with stress. If you're stressed, you it, it's like you kind of get these like blinkers on and just think about the immediate and, and really are not able to do the expansive thinking about the long term. And I, I don't know if the other panelists have something to add to that, but I think that that's really interesting that we're kind of in this stressed society that uh, that prevents us from thinking too far into the future. I'd just like to invite, I think it's what, thank you for the prompt. Thank you for the response, Claire M. I'm going to invite Alan, who's got his hand up uh, to jump in and then Claire O. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think playing into that is, is especially when we look at it um, from biases, human biases, loss aversion. If you give somebody something that would rather not have it taken away from them than actually get given it. And uh, even though it's the same thing. And so that makes it very difficult to go, oh, I might lose a little bit of my lifestyle for the long term because, oh no, I need it now. I need this, this fix on what I've already got used to. Um, and also the other side that, that plays into that is, and it's, they're all related, it's just another perspective on it, is that fear. You know, it's okay, we, we destroy the, the environment now, we can see what's happening. We know that in 20 years time, half the houses can't be insured. We know that everything, but that's 20 years away. Yeah, yeah. we'll be fine. The fact that it will cost us three times more because we've done it then doesn't matter. That's a long way away. I'm, I've done my job by now, I'm out. So it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a safer bet to just look at now. Thanks, Alan. Claire O. I think what ties into this is, um, you know, that stress, you know, I'm a former journalist um, and the kind of accelerated pace of negative news is what dominates, is what I think news editors think we want to read about. And I think we have to be intentional to actually expose ourselves to more positive storytelling because it frees up our brains to think, you know, about what's possible. There's a brilliant book by um, Robert Hopkins, who's um, from the UK and founder of the Transition Towns Movement, and it's called From What Is to What If. And he talks about the most powerful word, the pow most powerful word in the English language is the word imagine, because it unlocks our brain, it frees up our you know, ability to see potential, it frees up our ability to be creative and to solve problems. 
And I think not only do we need to create the, you know, correct this negative um, bias in the news, but we kind of need to correct it in our own head and be intentional about trying to find that balance so we can actually see what's possible. And Brilliant, thank you. I see another hand there as well, Rachel. Um, and can I just invite you to hold that just for one moment, purely out of timing, and I know that Claire O has to go. Thanks so much. <laughs> it's been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Claire can stay for another five minutes. Beautiful, in which case, with everyone's permission, Ronan had his hands up first um, out of um, fairness. So Ronan, followed by Rachel. Rachel, are you okay to hang on for another five minutes or so? Beautiful, thank you. Ronan. Uh, so I love the point about delayed gratification. Tim and I, you've we've spoken about uh, redefining success. And I think that's a kind of key thing we, we need to do. So the traditional models of measuring success in terms of monetary, et cetera, I think they need to be changed. Uh, for those of you who haven't read, there's a great book by Tim Duggan, Australian author, Cult Status, How to Build a Business of People at Door. And he talks about step one, think impact first. And I would suggest that when we think about the impact that we want to create in the world, it redefines the success criteria. I would say that uh, social entrepreneurs are actually <laughs> the ones who have embraced uh, delayed gratification the most because we know we're playing the long game and we measure ourselves like very differently. So I, we have obviously got a technology company. I don't define my success as the number of downloads of the app in the app store. I define our success by the impact that we're having. So that would be my my input and my my experience. Thanks, yeah, Tim. Lovely. Great, great question of posts. Thank you. Love that. Thank you. I'll just reflect quickly on that and then to you, Rachel. So in in that conversation that Ronan's referencing, yeah, he posed this specific question, like, what do we need to give up now to gain, you know, sort of in the long run? Um, and there's a lot of discomfort in that, right? And a lot of people's whole identity is based on not giving anything up right now, uh, but just acquiring and consuming and frankly extracting, right? So that that's a, that recognizing that that is extremely hard and difficult to walk off that path and be out in the wilderness for a while and then discover another one. How do we then do that with people collectively? And yeah, where are the spaces we can open up to do that? Rachel. Yeah, I think, um you know, the spaces to open up, I think the more and in practice, um, you know, this is in all the great spiritual practices around the world, more and in practice is so key. And what I've found is if I plug into that fear spectrum in the morning, before I've actually taken time to kind of connect into something bigger, I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about spirituality, connect into something, have some quiet time, and set up what I need to do with intention in my day, then it all goes wonky. And I think that, you know, more people that are coming into those kind of practices. And then I was just thinking about whether there's a morning meditation practice that's specifically in this regenerative, regenerative leadership space that might be something really powerful to plug into in the morning before I start the day. I was going to look, see if anything like that exists. So, um, so yeah. I would have a plethora of answers to that. And Clara Rock has got a hand up. Just very briefly, there's this um, wonderful woman I interviewed for the book, Nola Turner Jensen, and she's a Wiradjuri woman who is, um, you know, basically rediscovering the Wiradjuri language through place, through um, that country across New South Wales, biggest language group. Um, the way, um, and she taught me the way that First Nations people, uh, peoples are always thinking about how they're connected to everything else at all times. They're thinking about um, a bird or a tree or a place as you know being full of ancestors and that it's such an interesting and she gave me permission and you know I in turn pass that along to everyone around you know having permission to be able to think of ourselves as being deeply connected to people place nature um, and being part of that system because I think it totally reframes the way you start thinking about your role in the challenges that we face and you know the way that we can become part of holistic systems. It was just such a revelation for me to, to have that experience. And yeah, it was, it was it's just so wonderful. No, I love that. And I see Claire Marshall's hand and I'm just gonna read something that I shared this morning it's from one of my current favorite books, which I'll name in a moment, but here's the little quote. 
as a human open to the truth that something can be made sacred by the attention we grant it. All right, so that's from a wonderful book called Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature and Spirit. For those of you with a camera, there it is. Right. Um, by Leander Lynn Hout. And so do we make sacred our Instagram feed? Because we give that our attention. Do we make sacred ourselves and our embodied experience because we give that attention? Do we make sacred our relations with our family because we give them our attention? Do are we attentive simply to the loudest noise or the most frequent sound? Right. I think so. I love I love everything that's well, I love everything that's occurred in this whole session. I'm just so grateful that everyone's rocked up. Um, but I think this whole thing about radical presence, deep attention um is really really vital and a lot of nuance you know in that you know but that is always contextual moment by moment and agentic um so yeah rachel i'd love to open up some space and talk more directly about that and um uh, specifically morning practice but claire marshall please oh i just wanted to um to comment on that rachel that uh it's really funny we i'm with a group of futures researchers and we've kind of uh, we're working on a, a ritual which we define or is defined as intention, attention and repetition. And we're not doing something that's in the morning, but we're kind of using the concept of a ring and identity and the identity rings are rings that you kind of tend to wear on your little finger. And this, this uh, we're calling it the regen ring, uh, really focusing us on our kinship with all things. So there's a, there are these beautiful repetitions and lines, but kind of thinking of, yeah, that connected, but yeah, but as, yeah, as our kin. So if you're keen, when, we, when we've got something published, I can send it through to you. I'd love to hear more about morning rituals. So we'd love that. We'd love that. Okay. So on that, I'm going to do, so I do this, people that know me that will be laughing out loud now. I do this all the time. <clears throat> this, is my, <laughs> this is my favorite book right now. This is like, such a gift to the world i was in a session this morning and a question was asked <clears throat> of how do you come into paying attention and uh the response was uh, to those of you in australia go find you know an aboriginal person and if that person invites you to go on country with them like that is kind of like the the way to access that space <clears throat> and i agree with that and you know if if you have uh, the great privilege of being invited to connect with community then 100 percent and this is restoring the kinship worldview 28 indigenous precepts for rebalancing life um it's primarily centered in um, first nations on turtle island also known as north america um and does feature tyson younger porter um author of santor um but like you know there is so much in that book that speaks to everything that we've spoken about today and so much more. Um, so I highly, highly, highly recommend that. Um, yeah, just, there we go. Many more things. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording now. So everything that you've been holding that you don't wanna, you know, sort of let the rest of the world know about now you can bring it forth. Uh, so just before I do that purely for, you know, sort of uh, broadcasting, could I invite everybody that's willing to, to just unmute and say whatever they wanna say, just in a big kind of mass expression, including you, Claire Marshall, you can say goodbye right now. All right, she's gone. So whatever you wanna say, say it now, and I'm gonna turn the recording off and then we can talk for a little bit longer if you'd like. I'm so happy I came today. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very really very grateful inspiring. to be part of it today. Thank you, Tim. And Thanks team. for organising, Tim. Thank you. It's beautiful.